Uh, but you're joining us on the Frontiers North Adventures Tundra Buggy 1, and we are on the tundra on the shores of Hudson Bay. The wind is whistling outside. Uh, if, you take a, if you can take a peek outside around us, it is all white up there for sure, so it's very appropriate. And there is a mom and cub just behind our buggy, uh, which is pretty special. We've been lucky to see that today because it is a good year for polar bears here. There's some ice around, and so the bears, a lot of them are already out hunting, which is great, and I'll talk a little bit more about polar bears hunting shortly. Uh, but right now, I'd love to introduce you to our panel. My name is Elisa McCall, and I work for Polar Bears International as a staff scientist and director of conservation outreach. And can you introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Valeria Vergara. I'm a, a marine mammal biologist, have been studying belugas for the past number of years for Ocean Wise Conservation Organization, which is headquartered at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, hi, I'm Hilary White, and I am part of the science staff at the Churchill Northern Study Center, uh, which is a non-for-profit organization that does both educational programming and then it's also a remote research station. So I myself am a researcher working on climate change and how it affects the freshwater lakes and ponds in Wapusk National Park. Great, thank you both. So if you have any questions for our panel today, there's a couple ways you can ask them. There's a comment section underneath the window on the Polar Bears International website where you're likely watching this webcast. Uh, so you can type your comments in there and you can also send us emails at questions at pbears.org and we have people monitoring those and sending them to me right here. So we hope to take a lot of your questions today. We'll talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll wrap up. Uh, but first, uh, we should get started and maybe build a little bit more context about the area. So Hillary, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the special ecosystems that make up this Churchill area. Sure, yeah. So um, I really like to start off talking about how Churchill is kind of in this transition zone location. So we have a bunch of different transition zones here. Um, the biggest one is the transition between the tundra ecosystem and the boreal spruce forest. Um, so we're right at the tree line at Churchill. So around us right now, if you had a chance to look, or actually you can see it right now, we're uh, on the tundra, so it's very flat, not a lot of vegetation, and in the winter time, we don't actually get a lot of snow accumulation just because there's so much wind up here. Oh, yeah, nice, and the polar bears are moving. That's great. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> um, yeah, and so then that transitions right into the boreal spruce forest. So up here we mainly have black spruce, but there's also some white, white spruce and tamarack or larch trees. Um, so it's an open canopy woodland that we have up here. Um, and yeah, so that's where a lot of the snow gets stored. And that's a really important feature to have more snow kind of protected in these areas so little critters like lemmings and voles and foxes can survive in the winter and have a little bit of that kind of heat um, safety area in the really cold months that we have up here. Additionally, um, there's a transition between discontinuous and continuous permafrost up here. So that kind of the line between <coughs> where we have upwards to 50 meters of permafrost beneath Churchill is kind of right around this area. Um, and permafrost is a pretty cool thing because 25% of um, the terrestrial North American uh, continent is underlain by permafrost. So it's not just kind of an Arctic thing that we need to keep an eye on. So if climate warming continues to happen, which we have been seeing up in this region, the permafrost is going to thaw, which is going to have pretty huge ramifications on the landscape around here. Um, and then also, I guess we could talk about the transition between like a marine and freshwater ecosystem because we have um, an estuary here right at the Churchill River, which is a really great place for the belugas, which we're going to talk a lot about today, I think. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Churchill is really a special place. You mentioned some animals out there, the meadow voles, lemmings, foxes, and we've already seen many of those. Some of them on the explore.org live cam mounted on Buggy One. So that's pretty neat. We have all sorts of little things out here, but we also have these fantastic uh, polar bears and belugas, which we'll talk about. And just to give you more context, what you're watching right now, uh, we believe it is a mom and cub behind us, and you see them interacting with each other and kind of uh, getting a bit of shelter from the raging winds outside today. Uh, so that's pretty cute. We'll keep that playing for a while. And on Buggy One, we have a mobile broadcasting <coughs> studio. It's a fantastic uh, little tundra buggy, and we get to roam around and bring these live polar bears right to you, thanks to explore.org and Frontier 
Adventures North Adventures for that, so it's a lot of fun. Well, let's get to the polar bears and belugas. You have already <laughs> sent in a ton of questions, and that is fantastic because they're both pretty exciting animals. And really cool thing about both animals is that um, a lot of conservation measures to protect both of them help everybody, which we will talk about at the end here. But maybe right now what we can do is build a little context for these animals. Uh, Valeria, I was wondering if you could give us a few you know, beluga basics and maybe talk a bit about what you know about beluga. What do you think people should know about belugas? Oh my God. A couple minutes. I know, it's a tough, <laughs> Absolutely. It's a tough one. Yeah. So uh, one of the neatest things about belugas is that they are are really a sound-centered species and that is something that really really makes you understand this animal to think about them as their sense of sound being equivalent to our sense of vision sound to these animals is everything they use it to navigate to find their way in dark Arctic waters in ice leads um, to find prey, to communicate with one another, to maintain contact between mothers and calves. Imagine if you have a little calf in this, you know, turbid environment mm -hmm. underwater, and you need to maintain contact with this little calf. You need sound. Um, so it's a really fundamental aspect of, of their lives, and they're called sea canaries. And they've been known as sea canaries for, for decades um, because of the really huge variety of, of sounds uh, that they make. They are also a very, very social species, and sound is the glue of their, of their society. Um, the, they, the herds are composed by sort of matrilineal groups of grandmother and daughter, um, and the daughter of that daughter, and calves from this year and previous years. Females help um, other females to raise those young, and these little groups of, of, of familiar females join and split and rejoin other such similar groups. And then the males band together and roam around and they form long-term friendships. So a really complex, beautiful uh, society. And they spend, in all populations across the world, they spend their, their summers in estuaries. And this is why we find them in Churchill. Um, the, the Churchill belugas are part of the Western Hudson Bay beluga population. There's about 57,000 of them. And that is great because overall we have about 200,000 beluga in the world, give or take a few thousand. So Churchill uh, it's, it has a very large part of the world's population of, uh, of beluga whales. And um, we see them in, in the Churchill River estuary, the Seal River estuary, and the Nelson River estuary during the summer when they come uh, to, to calf, um, to socialize their calves, to mold their skins, and to feed, feed for a, a few uh, weeks each summer. Thank you for that. They are a fascinating animal. And yeah. if you are interested in watching the belugas live in the summer, July and August, you can tune into the explore.org underwater beluga cam and watch what the belugas are doing. And hopefully, we might get Valeria back next summer and have her talk about the belugas with belugas outside, which would be fantastic. So <laughs> definitely stay tuned for that. They're amazing. So you mentioned a couple things. Uh, that we can kind of compare to polar bears. So um, you said belugas are very sound oriented, they're very acoustic. Yeah. Polar bears aren't so much acoustic, but they rely a lot more on their smell. That's right. Yeah. So polar bears have this incredible sense of smell, which I'm sure many of you know. Now they can't smell, you know, a 40 mile radius, which is a, a bit of a myth, but they can smell very well, maybe up to a kilometer or something around them. And they navigate based on wind. So recent research has showed us that polar bears like to walk across the wind. So if you imagine the wind coming straight on, they're walking right across it. So they're getting all these different air streams coming from wherever the wind's coming from. And this is an efficient way to hunt because they get all these different um, streams of air and then they can choose what one they want. If they're just walking into the wind, they're only getting one air stream. And so they're really using their nose to guide them out there to food and to guide them to mates. So one thing that we know polar bears do out on the sea ice is find each other via scent. And one of the ways they do that is by paw prints. So this is a mold of a, a paw print. Um, I'm going to try to hold it still for BJ, uh, who's producing this show right now. So 
polar bears in the spring, when females are ready to mate, they can release a scent into their footprints that they leave on the sea ice. And male polar bears can actually pick up that smell, navigate to the footprints, and will walk in a female's footprints for days if they have to until they find her on the sea ice. And that's one way that they have a neat communication with each other. And that's one reason we are concerned uh, with sea ice decline. So the biggest issue for polar bears is they're losing their habitat due to climate warming, reducing their sea ice habitat. Uh, but it's not only about access to food, even though that's the main thing, so polar bears need sea ice to eat seals, uh, but as we see sea ice thinning and moving more, it, it's breaking up more, it's shifting more, polar bears are in a bit more of a treadmill out there, and they're losing these foot patterns. If you can imagine you're tracking something with footprints for days, and all of a sudden the footprints just disappear because that chunk of ice has moved away, and so you've wasted a lot of energy and you haven't found a friend out there, so that's one of the things we are concerned about. And polar bears aren't quite as social as belugas, really. I mean, in Churchill, we have this incredible opportunity to view larger groups of polar bears, but that's really not uh, super common throughout the entire polar bear world. Uh, here, they're congregating together. At this time of year, they're waiting for the sea ice to come back. Sea ice in Hudson Bay completely melts in the summer and completely refreezes in the winter. And in this period, in the fall, before the sea ice has froze up again, uh, polar bears are hungry. They're waiting. They've been on land, not really eating for months, and so they're moving up here. They're kind of getting first in the dinner line. Um, and so we do see groups of them. But when they're out on the sea ice, besides mating and besides moms and cubs, they really don't have these huge groups of them hunting. They're mostly solitary as far as we know right now. And so that's another difference between polar bears and belugas. Um, but one common thread that they have is that they're both a marine mammal. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So belugas, of course, a marine mammal, rely on the underwater environment and the oceans to survive. And polar bears also rely on the oceans, but the sea ice of the oceans. And actually, belugas need sea ice too. And maybe you could explain why belugas need sea ice. Absolutely. So belugas have evolved for thousands of, year, of years. Um, in, in, in Arctic and subarctic areas of the world. And they use sea ice um, to feed because they rely on sea ice dependent species for their diet. They use sea ice uh, to shelter from the very strong winds, for example. They use sea ice uh, to shelter from predators like killer whales that cannot reach as far. Belugas have a really cool adaptation to sea ice. You, if you think about a bunch of other whales, think about their dorsal fins. Think about the dorsal fins of killer whales, for example, very large and pointy. Belugas don't have a dorsal fin, they have a dorsal ridge. And this is a sea ice adaptation, an adaptation to their Arctic life, so that they can navigate underneath the ice and not, um, not rub what, you know, if they had a big do dorsal fin, they, it, could, it could get hurt against the ice. Mm -hmm. But in this way, they can just navigate under the ice very smoothly. And it also means that they can hide in very icy areas from predators that cannot reach that far, um, that far north. That is changing a little bit. Uh, so killer whales have been sighted in areas where they have not been sighted in the past. Uh, so there is some concern that killer whales are moving north and they are uh, predators of, of beluga whales. Another thing that is happening with the changing ice patterns is that belugas get entrapped in little ice holes. And that has always happened. Um, people have been reporting these entrapments for decades. And polar bears uh, that generally don't prey on belugas because they are a very difficult thing to prey on. They rather go for seals. But polar bears can be opportunistic. And if there's a beluga that they can have as a meal, they, they will. So, so when belugas strand or when belugas get trapped in l these little um, ice uh, holes, they will uh, prey, on, uh, b polar bears will prey on belugas. And this is happen happening a little bit more often. Um, another thing that is happening with, with ice changing is that their prey is shifting. So um, ice dependent prey is decreasing in numbers, such as uh, Arctic cod, Arctic char, Halibut, mm. and more temperate prey are moving north. And so belugas have been able to adapt to this. For example, in some areas they've switched um, their prey uh, base considerably to capelin, but we don't know nut nutritionally how this is going to affect them. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. That's incredible. There are so many, yeah, <laughs> so many neat things. But Arc Arctic Sea Ice is so important. It's a cool, such a cool environment. And Absolutely. I think I never really appreciated it very much until I came up here. But sea ice is really like the soil in a forest. It's growing the base of this whole food chain. Mm -hmm. So it's actually helping the entire ecosystem function, first yeah. of all. It's also protecting belugas. That's it's right. It's providing polar bears a platform on which to hunt and on which to find each other and mate and reproduce. Uh, it acts like the air conditioner for the entire planet, which is just amazing. Sea ice is very reflective, and when it covers the Arctic, it's reflecting a lot of sun's rays away, and that helps keep us cooler. And as we lose sea ice, more sunlight is getting absorbed into the ocean and atmosphere, so it's warming up the planet. And I'm sure all of us have been up in the north where we've had to wear a lot of sunscreen. That sea ice and snow is so reflective, and so it's great to have up there for all these different reasons. Uh, so that is pretty cool. So I'm going to get into some questions, because we have a lot coming in, and they're super fun. Uh, one kind of one that we haven't really talked about before um, is, are beluga whales dangerous? And some people might not know if they've never really seen a beluga whale in the wild. They don't know if they're dangerous. Of course. Uh, no, beluga whales are, are generally not uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, you always have to be respectful of, of wildlife. Uh, but no, they're generally very curious creatures, um, actually. And... Um, they do, uh, you know, at, when you study their sounds, you get to learn their aggressive calls as mm -hmm. well as their playful calls or their contact calls. And so they do get into little fights with one another, absolutely, as all social mammals do. Uh, but they are not a dangerous uh, species, not, not in the sense, uh, not, not in the way polar bears are. We have to be very careful with polar bears right. in the tundra, um, yeah. not, not so much with, with beluga whales. And how big are beluga whales? Maybe so we can compare the two. So males, this, they have sexual dimorphism. That, mm. is, uh, that means that males are slightly bigger than females. Not by much, but they are definitely bigger. Um, females average around 3.5 meters okay. and, uh, in length. And males average between 3.5 and 5 meters in length. Oh, that's quite long. Um, so yes. Uh, the males have bigger shoulders and a bit of a bigger melon. So when you've worked with belugas for a while, you can usually identify a group of males if you, if you see them. And that's similar to polar bears. They also have dimorphism, the that's two right. sizes. So male polar bears are about twice as big as females. Females can be uh, four to 500 pounds pretty normally, and males can be over 1,000 pounds, you know, 1,200 or so pounds. Uh, and again, yeah, we do see an older male is easy, easy-ish to tell. Actually, they often have scars on their face from fighting each other in the right. spring for mates. And they're also, yeah, more wider set, thicker necks. Uh, but young males can be quite difficult to tell from females. So we really can't for sure say uh, that we know what a polar bear's gender is until we get um, up close <laughs> to it and maybe, uh, maybe even handle it if we're doing research on it. And maybe we can talk a little bit about research for a minute um, because it is really difficult to study marine mammals. You know, marine, by nature of them, they either want to be under the water far away yes. or polar bears want to be way out on the sea ice far away from us. So uh, we really use technology to study these animals. And could you talk briefly about some of the research you've done? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when we first started as marine biologists following these different species of cetaceans, mm -hmm. we, would, we'd, we would follow them for a, from a boat or, or watch them from shore. And there's very few things you can tell mm -hmm. about them when you're really, when you just have your eyes or binoculars. You can tell if they're traveling, you can tell if they're feeding because they're fluking. They're, they okay. tend to do this movement and fluke up and so you know they're going for prey under the surface. Um, y you, you know if they're in a restful mode, but mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. All of a sudden, there's drones. Drone technology changed everything. <laughs> the first time I used uh, drones in, in the Arctic, I realized just what an amazing tool this would be to understand their behavior. And this video you're looking at right now is in the St. Lawrence River estuary. It was filmed by my colleagues at GREM, the, the Group for Research and Education of Marine Mammals. I collaborate with them every uh, summer. And this is a group of males. They're being incredibly social and you might be able to hear their sounds uh, and these sounds are synchronized to the second with this footage wow. so this is allowing us to to understand behavior to understand the way these animals use these sounds to an extent that we were never able to 
to do before. And so our understanding of these animals is jumping in leaps and bounds. That's incredible. Yes. What a neat thing. We it's also cool. use a similar technology to study polar bears, which is pretty neat. One example at Polar Bears International is our maternal den cam, or, or our live cam too, what allows you to get a peek into the polar bear's world. But our maternal den cam is one project we have that started in Alaska and is now expanded to Svalbard, Norway. Done at PBI, and specifically uh, BJ Kirschhofer, who's sitting right in front of me here, you can't see, uh, is put out these remote cameras, snuck them out where we know a polar bear mom is standing, gone really quietly, dropped a camera, and then we've gotten out of there so we don't disturb her. And we've allowed this camera to run by itself and capture footage of a mother polar bear emerging with her brand new cubs for the first time in the cub's life. And so females will den, give birth in their dens, and nurse their cubs until they're able to emerge from the den, and then they'll go to the sea ice as soon as they can. And they'll go to the sea ice to hunt, of course, because mom is pretty hungry. She's gone many months without eating, and in this area, maybe up to eight months without eating. Uh, but what we can see from this footage is we can get an idea of how healthy the family looks, how many cubs are born, uh, what shape is mom in, what are they doing? Just getting some idea of their behavior when they emerge from a den is really important and will continue to be important as human activity expands throughout the Arctic into really important denning areas. Uh, one important denning area is Wapusk National Park where Hillary does some of her work. Um, and where we do a lot of our polar bear research, and it's one of the most important polar bear denning areas in the world. And similar to uh, Valeria's work on the Western Hudson Bay belugas, we are in Western Hudson Bay polar bear population country right now, so the bears that we're seeing outside are from the Western Hudson Bay, and there are currently about 800 to 900 polar bears in this population, but there are 19 around the whole world, um, and we think there are between 20 to 25,000 polar bears in the wild. So fewer polar bears in the entire Arctic than belugas that come just to these rivers here, which is pretty incredible, but yeah. there are a lot of belugas. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic to see. So maybe we'll grab some more questions because there's so many and they're so good. Um, okay, does climate change, I'm not sure if you can speak much to this or if we know, but do we know if climate change affects the reproduction of the whales hmm. so far? So that is a really good question. Reproduction success reproductive success mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the health of the animal right and climate climate change is uh, has tremendous repercussions on the food web mm -hmm. which means that th there has been quite a notable shift in diets for beluga whales in various populations in the world um, and this might affect their nutritional state if they, if belugas get pregnant and they don't get enough nutrition, um, they might not be able to give birth successfully or they might mm -hmm. give birth and not be able to, to nurse this calf uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. So we really don't know how this shift in diet is affecting the body condition um, and the, re the reproductive health of, of belugas and, and whether they are able to, for example, get pregnant as often. Right. Maybe the interbirth interval has, has increased in some areas. This is something that is being explored in the St. Lawrence River estuary where belugas are endangered. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very good question. Yeah. And we yes. do know that climate change does affect reproduction in polar bears. And it's very similar that climate change means that they're in poor body condition. Um, That's right. For polar bears, climate change equates to loss of habitat, loss of sea ice which equates to loss of calories. Really, it just comes down to food, energy in, energy out. Polar bears are moving more um, and eating less over time. So in Western Hudson Bay, we've seen the ice change in, over the last few decades, and we've been able to study that because we do have several decades of data on sea ice and polar bears here, and we do need these long-term data sets to understand what's going on. And we've seen that females in this area, they have gotten smaller and they are having fewer cubs now, and that is tied to sea ice conditions in the area. If a female isn't uh, fat enough to carry a successful pregnancy, she's not going to have as many cubs, or any cubs potentially. And we still are seeing cubs born here, and yeah. in fact, maybe that one is still on our camera right now, which is great, uh, but there's just fewer over time, which of course leads to smaller populations over time. And we know that we can reverse this trend, absolutely. Uh, there's the all, and I'm seeing a ton of questions about, well, how can we help polar bears or and belugas, and why is it important? Why is you know how can we help sea ice? It's really pretty simple. Uh, so when humans burn fossil fuels like coal and oil, we release carbon emissions into the atmosphere. 
And in regular amounts, carbon emissions are a good thing. They form this heat-trapping blanket and they keep us warm. But we are burning rampant amounts of fossil fuels, and so we are thickening our heat-trapping blanket. And we have simply trapped too much heat for Earth to really be comfortable. And so we're seeing these changes going on all around us. And one of those changes, of course, is declining ice. I think we've all been outside in the summer with some ice cubes in our drink, and, you know, the, the ice is going to melt when it gets warm. It's pretty basic. And so we have seen these long-term shifts in Arctic sea ice, and they are expected to continue if we don't do anything. In Hudson Bay, I saw a question about what's going to happen in Hudson Bay. If we did absolutely nothing, we do expect to not have sea ice here by about mid-century or late century. And we could lose up to two-thirds of the world's polar bears by the end of the century if we do absolutely nothing. But we are seeing things being done. And right now, there's the COP23 talks in Bonn, Germany. So all these countries are getting together. They're committing uh, to hitting these targets, these climate targets. Uh, and people are working together in their schools, in their towns, in their provinces or states, and in their countries to make changes. And those changes are things we have the technology to do already. So technology is amazing, and we already have these things that we can do. So we can switch to more solar and wind. We can move away from fossil fuels. Uh, when you're in your own school, you could be looking at um, carpooling more more busing, biking, walking. Uh, you could be writing to your mayor and your city council asking for them to maybe rezone areas, maybe have a grocery store in a neighborhood where people can walk to get their food and you don't have to drive 20 minutes for basics. All sorts of things like that. There's a lot of great information on the polarbearsinternational.org website about ways you can get involved. Uh, one of our projects right now, Project Polar Bear, is kicking off and we support groups of students all over the world coming up with some sort of uh, carbon reducing project in your school or community and so check that out if you'd like to sign up and there's also if you're in Manitoba right now the Manitoba Envirothon check that out sign up is that by the end of this week so we can do such a cool project mm -hmm. and you might get a chance to come to Churchill in the spring yeah. next year to do the Envirothon which would be pretty cool so lots of different ways we can get involved so I'm going to come back and take a few more questions. Um, so this is kind of a neat one, and I'm going to actually go through all of us. So Hillary, I'll actually start with you. Uh, Charlie wants to know, what is your favorite and your least favorite part of your job? It's mm, a great question. Um, so I would say my favorite part of my job is actually getting to work with the general public. So the cool thing about the Churchill Northern Study Center is that we have a lot of people coming in for learning vacations and then also for citizen science projects through Earthwatch. Um, we have a partner organization called Earthwatch and we have a group of people that they could be teenagers or they could be um, just just regular people off the street <laughs> that just want to do some science and so they go out into the field with with me or other scientists at the study center and you take samples and you go back to the lab and then you process the samples and so you're part of this kind of long-term monitoring project that we're working on and to me that's really inspiring because I'm a scientist and I do research but then also it's really exciting to have other people that may not have a science background that still want to kind of come and learn and be a part of um, solving this climate change problem that we have right now. So that's probably my favorite part. Um, least favorite part? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's tough. I'm, so I'm just finishing up my PhD right now so I'm in kind of the editing and research, like editing and writing up all of my research phase. And so that's maybe my, my least favorite part, the writing side of things, which I think is somewhat common. <laughs> I think most most researchers really enjoy kind of the field work and looking at their data and then maybe less excited mm -hmm. about writing it all up. But it's still very important because we need to communicate our science. So I know Absolutely. it's important, but yeah. that's probably my least favorite part. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the reason <laughs> we brought you here to communicate your science to people yeah. all over the world. So yeah, but this is a little more fun than sitting at a computer Way more and fun. crunching yeah. numbers maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Valeria, fa favorite and least favorite? <laughs> <laughs> so again, I think many of us would say that, that uh, one, of, one of the best parts of this kind of job is to be out there in nature with your study species. Um, I am just, when I am out, out on the water with the whales, I have the hydrophone in the water and speakers outside and we can hear the whales while we watch them. Nothing beats that. It's, it's, they, they are extraordinary moments. Uh, least favorite, there's a couple. Um, I spent, I need to spend quite extended periods of time away from my family, away from my daughter. I have an 11 year old uh, daughter and these are the sacrifices that a, a lot of field biologists have to make. 
uh, you don't study your you don't you don't work with your study species at home. You have to travel often to very far places, mm -hmm. where you usually cannot take your family, and so um, so that part is is difficult. Um, and there's something about and this is this what you said was just great <laughs> about analyzing data at your desk, which is both exciting and tedious. People yeah. see field biologists as these, uh, you know, they tend to romanticize us. Uh, it's, oh, you have the best job in the world and you do nothing but neat things. And for every hour of field data that you collect, you have 50 hours of time on the computer deconstructing and analyzing and organizing this data and writing about it. So there's many, many, many long hours of, of computer work. Uh, to be done, which can be exciting because that's when you find patterns. That is when you, when you really can dig into the data and find out the good stuff. But, <laughs> but it is, it's work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks both. And yeah, also my favorite, just being in the field, being out here, here, and then actually doing the field work with polar bears. It's just so exciting to actually see the animal that you're working with. Because again, for the rest of the year, yeah. really behind a computer, <laughs> and it's still, you know, yeah. great. Uh, but it's nice to be, you know, seeing what we're working with here. And uh, for long stretches of time, I will be at a computer every day for weeks on end, either analyzing, inputting data, uh, writing reports. Uh, a lot of what we do, and I don't mean to speak for you, but as a biologist, a lot of what you do is you, if you have a project idea, you need money to do that project. Absolutely. So you're always finding yeah. grants. Uh, you are, and this is where good communication also comes in. You have to convince people, but you have to have a good reason to do your project, convince people you have a good reason and yeah. why these different agencies should want to fund your work. Uh, it, you know, some hoops to jump through, and then when you do do the work, then you have to write the reports about it and say, yeah, I used your money really well, here I can prove it, here's this research, it was great, um, really important. So a lot of a lot of computer work, but it definitely makes it all worth it when yeah. we can come out here and see, see our steady animals and be with great people and talk to you, talk to all sorts of great people and answer great questions. So here's a question for you, Valeria. Now, if we lost beluga whales completely in the mm -hmm. Arctic, what would that have any effect on humans, or what would that do to this greater ecosystem? Well, there's a lot of uh, humans uh, um, that live up in the Arctic and that have evolved alongside beluga whales right. hunt belugas and and uh, um, use belugas for part of their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. They um, eat what is called the beluga maktak, which is very fatty and very uh, nutritious. Mm -hmm. um, that way of life and that source of food uh, would get lost for, for um, many Inuit communities up north. Um, I also think of the loss of a species as a loss to, to humankind. I mean, to, to not have beluga whales to not be able to teach kids about beluga whales in the present time, uh, that would be a tragedy. Yeah. Um, I don't think we're near uh, that mm -hmm. yet, thankfully. Um, so hopefully we, we, we will stop this climate change trend before that ever happens. Definitely. Yeah, and again, very similar to polar bears. Uh, people have evolved alongside polar bears. Uh, use them as part of their traditional hunting and they're very closely tied to many northern cultures and so it's very important for those people that we keep polar bears in the arctic but again i do think it's important for all of us um, to not have this iconic species of the north would just be a tragedy so we want to protect yeah. them for future generations uh, because it's the right thing to do but also because it means having a healthy environment for all of us and again it's neat to kind of choose these ice dependent species to study and want to conserve because all these actions that you can take at home uh, for sea ice and polar bears and even belugas uh, those actions help the entire planet and it will help cheetahs and it will help buffalo and rhino and pandas and all these different animals that you know depend on healthy functioning ecosystems we're all tied together even though we're way up here in polar bear country we are tied to wherever you are in some way for sure so Thank you so much today for all your great questions. We really appreciate it. You guys tuning in. We do have people still online to answer more questions. And we do have another um, 
live chat this afternoon and a webcast tomorrow, more about polar bears and tracking them and studying them. And uh, we'll be speaking also to Valeria on explore.org in a couple hours, more about belugas if you can tune into any of that. All these uh, archives will be posted eventually on our website, so check them out again. And we would really appreciate if any teachers or students or anyone out there watching would fill out our feedback survey online. So everyone that fills out a feedback survey will be entered to win a polar bear adoption this year. Really great, you know, classroom mascot. You get a little stuffed polar bear and, and um, adoption in your name. And you will also receive a link to special online resources that we haven't posted publicly yet. So please consider the feedback survey. Check out Project Polar Bear. If you're especially in Manitoba, but I think all over, check out the Envirothon if you want to get involved in that. Uh, thanks to Frontier School Division this week. We're also working with them tomorrow at the Churchill Northern Study Center. We'll have all of these folks back. It will be really, really great. And thank you for whatever you're doing for polar bears and for being interested in what we're doing out here. We are going to continue to keep an eye outside in these roaring winds. We're going to stay warm um, and try to find more polar bears and see where they're at. So thank you so much to the panelists today yeah. talking thank about you. all sorts of great <laughs> stuff up here. <laughs> yeah, and we'll sign off for now, um, but check us out online and we'll talk to you soon.